the chair. Out of the chair. We're doing something different here. Come on. Out of my way. Behind me or something. Marie Jean Larritière, Richten Richten. Once there was a king who reigned over one of the most beautiful kingdoms of Europe, whose name, however, historians can no longer trace. The king was known for his sense of justice, rectitude, and paternal love for his subjects, and thus he acquired the glorious name of King Prudhomme which was, during those times, signified a king full of integrity and honor. This king was married to a lady who had many virtues as well. Since she was especially lively and active, and constantly occupied herself with some pleasant work, the people called her the Queen Laborieuse. The king and queen had an only son, whose inclinations were still as virtuous as at birth. But since the prince had inherited the vivacity of the queen his mother, and was not obliged to work during his youth, he expended his energies in pleasure. He took a great liking to the theater, and balls, tournaments, and hunting parties. In short, he was extremely eager to do anything that would furnish him diversion of whatever kind, and thus he came to be known by the name of Amour Joie. The king and queen regarded their son's manner of amusing himself as innocent, and did not oppose his purchase for pleasure. Indeed, they felt that his eagerness he displayed for amusements would be but a passing phase of his youth. Aside from this, the prince was quite likable, and it was clear from all his actions that he had a fiery spirit. What surprised most people, however, was that such a vivacious prince had not yet fallen in love and did not regard affairs of the heart as significant. The only feature of his heart was to prepare, was to participate at the gallant festivals and in the hunts, which he found stimulating because they tended to be unique and various. At times, while pursuing a stag, he would become separated from the rest of his hunting party, and sometimes he would become so famished before he could find his people again that he would enter the home of the first country gentleman or the first peasant whom he encountered on his way. Since he ordinarily did not reveal who he was, he enjoyed many a bizarre adventure. Later, at court, he would relate them to his father with extreme delight. One day, when he had again been separated from his entourage, he came across a village that at first appeared deserted. Suddenly he saw a dazzling maiden emerge from the garden. An old woman with an unpleasant face was dragging her violently towards a rustic cottage on the other side of the road. The maiden had a distaff packed with linseed at her side and harbored in the folds of her dress a bunch of flowers which she had gathered in the garden. The old woman tore the flowers from her, threw them down in the middle of the road, and gave the lovely girl some harsh blows. Then she took her by the arm and said in a furious tone, Let's go, let's go, you miserable creature, back to the house. I'll teach you what it means to be so impudent and be disobedient. The prince, who had stopped to watch the spectacle, approached the old woman just as she was about to enter the cottage, and asked her in a gentle voice, Why are you abusing this young girl, my good woman? What has she done to make you so angry? The peasant woman, who was in a fit of fury and did not like anyone to mix into her affairs, was about to respond insolently to the prince. But when she glanced at his garments and judged by their splendor that they closed a the person of distinction, she controlled her fury and contented herself by answering in a bitter voice, My lord, I'm quarreling with my daughter because she always does the opposite of what I tell her, and I don't want her to spin any more. And yet she spins from morning until night, and is so diligent that nobody can match her work. It is only because she spins too much that I scold her. What? said the prince. Is that a reason to complain about this poor girl child? Ah, truly, my good woman, if you dislike girls because they enjoy spinning too much, 
you should give your daughter to my mother, the queen, who finds this occupation most pleasant and loves girls who know how to spin. The queen will make your daughter rich. Alas, my lord, responded the old woman, if this conceited snip here with her pretty skills seems suitable for your good queen, you can have her right away, for she has long been a burden to me, and I'd like to get rid of her. Just then, a number of the prince's hunting party rejoined him, and told one of his valets to place the beautiful maiden on the rump of the horse behind him. The girl's face was still covered with tears because of the old woman's threats and treatments, but her crime did not distract, detract at all from her charms. The prince tried to console her, assuring her that with the, the skills she possessed, she, she could not fi fail to find a great deal of favor in the eyes of the queen. However, the poor girl was so bewildered by the numerous men surrounding her, she did not even hear half of what the prince said to her. Her mother watched her departure without evincing the slightest interest in her daughter's destiny, while the few villagers who had appeared could not open their eyes wide enough as they watched her in the midst of all those great lords garnished with gold. These, the prince's officers, were leading her to the queen, and thus she was the envy of all the peasant girls who saw her as she passed. Along the way, the prince learned that the beauty's name was Rosani, and as soon as they arrived at the palace, he presented her to the queen as the most skillful and diligent spinner in the entire kingdom. The queen gave her a kind of welcome, regarded her attentively, and praised her modest and touching charms, which mortified certain ladies of the court, who prided themselves on their perfect beauty. The queen provided lodgings for Rosani in the palace, and there was a great suite of rooms completely filled with large mixes of the best fillets in the world. There was hemp from Syria and Brittany, and flax from the Isles of Ithaca, from Picardy and Flanders. In fact, there was even that famous incombustible flax out of which no one can make out of which one can make a one marvelous cloth that is that the most scorching fire cannot damage. Rosany was told, as if it was good news, that she had only to choose among flax and hemp, and she could set to work whenever she wished. Then someone added that since she was stronger and more skillful than anyone else, the queen wanted to help her keep her a long time and do much good for her, having destined her to spin all the fibers in the apartment. When the poor girl was alone, she fell into the utmost despair, for in truth she had such an insurmountable aversion to the métier of spinning that she regarded just a few hours of this work as an atrocious punishment. It was true that when she was energetic enough to occupy herself with spinning, she performed the work with infinite skill. Her yarn was perfectly even and fine, but she spun so terribly slowly that even if she could ultimately have gathered her strength and retained her assiduity from morning until night, she hardly would have been able to spin more than half a spindle of yarn each day. Given her disposition, one can judge the pain she felt in respect to the queen's attitude. Rosanine did not know how she would be able to get herself out of this predicament, created by her malicious mother. Still, she was glad to be out of the hands of the old woman, who had only really harsh feelings towards her. The gracious and kind welcome by the queen had captured her imagination. The court, which she had viewed as in a flash of lightning, seemed to her already a most pleasant place. She was charmed by all the objects her eyes encountered, yet knowing she could only sustain herself at court by showing what a nimble spinner she was, she was well aware she did not have the talent for this. Preoccupied by these cruel thoughts, she did not slip a wink at first that night, nor did the prince sleep. The naive grace and charms of Rosany had made so striking an impression on his heart that he spent the entire night in visiting her only. As soon as it became day, as soon as it became day, the queen sent a message to Rosany ordering her to come and talk with her. 
Everyone was in full dress in the Queen's chambers that morning, and when Rosany arrived, our group of ladies avidly cast glances at her face. The King, who had not seen her until then, happened to be there and regarded the young beauty avidly, bestowing praise on her. The Prince was also in his mother's chambers, and thought he th thought the girl even more beautiful than his father did. He said nothing. Despite the simplicity of her violet corset and the rustic manner of her coiffure, Roseanne truly captivated the eyes of all who regarded her, for she had a fine and well-shaped figure and a free and easy manner. Indeed, though she lacked education, she did not have the awkward air of a village maiden. Her hair was the most beautiful ash blonde, and her face, ornamented by glistening blue eyes, were so soft as they were alert. Her nose was perfectly proportioned, she had a small mouth, pleasantly shaped. Moreover, she had splendid teeth. As is necessary for one to be perfectly beautiful. And her complexion was dazzling white and enriched by a tinge of red that made her glow. Her remarkable features and complexion did not blind one to the lively charms of her face and personality and whatever else contributes to the soul of beauty. Though she had not slept that night, she did not seem all, uh, all downcast. The confusion she experienced on being exposed to the view of numerous people at court made her blush, so that her attractive features were only heightened. It was clear to see that since she was a spinner, she had been obliged to stay within four walls. Her complexion had been protected from the ravages of the sun. Those ladies who considered themselves beautiful felt extremely spiteful toward Rosanne and tried to find fault with her face and figure, while the astonishing young men, astonished young men conceived a thousand ridiculous plans to win her. In sum, no matter how one viewed her, she drew the attention of the entire court. Before the king departed, he advised the queen to give another dress to the beautiful spinner, since she, hers was too different from that of all the other young women at the palace. The queen had already devoted some thought to this, and, in fact, a few hours later, a servant bought Rosine a dress and ha headed that perfectly confirmed to the prevailing mode of the court of the king Prudhomme. The queen's chambermaids dressed her and combed her hair with a great deal of care. Afterwards, they showed her exactly how she was to go about grooming herself and fixing her clothes thenceforward. The garments fitted her splendidly, and she appeared in perfect array at the chapel, where the prince found her more beautiful than ever, and he praise on her for all to hear. All those at court who had not seen her in the queen's chambers regarded her with eager curiosity, and since the king had called her the beautiful spinner, the flattering designation stuck with her. In less than twenty-four hours, she had become the cynosure of fashion of the court and in the city, so that there was not a single conversation in which the beautiful spinner did not enter for some reason. Nevertheless, though there were a hundred beautiful young women at the court jealous of her good fortune and tired of hearing everyone talk so much about her, the young maiden in question was experiencing some sad moments. During the course of the first day she had spent in the palace, she had found a way to excuse herself from spinning by saying she had cramps in her fingers. The anxiety she felt about the constraining work for which she was destined was offset by the delight she had in being so richly dressed and in hearing the, her beauty praised a thousand times. The queen's ladies-in-waiting, most of whom were no longer young and could no longer boast about their beauty, took a great liking to Rosany, and she responded to their affection with extreme complacence. They promenaded all with her all over the palace and in different places of the city, and these walks were a great distraction for this new member of the court, whose eyes were not accustomed to seeing so many magnificent things. Yet, when she returned in the evening to that faithful apartment filled with flax, she was repelled by the odious sight and sank once again into a state of despair. Still, she was able to regain some of her tranquility and to sleep much better than she had the first night.
The next day, after she had arisen, she thought about putting on the beautiful clothes that the queen had given her, but she did not remember how to get dressed properly in the way that the queen's chambermaids had taught her. She tried twenty different times to make herself appear tolerably well-dressed, but could not succeed. Finally, after many fruitless attempts, she decided that her headdress and garments would have to remain odd and awkward on her. Greatly depressed by her lack of success, she sought to compensate for it in other ways, so she loaded her distaff and began to spin, but her hand was just as slow as ever. Despite all her efforts, she only succeeded in spinning a quarter sin bin old yarn from ten o'clock, and when she had finished dressing, and the time when she had finished dressing, until twelve thirty, when the messenger arrived from the queen, saying her majesty wanted to see her work. Rosini received the message and burst into tears. Then she applied herself to thinking up a new excuse to help her out of the predicament. Appearing downcast before the queen, she told her that she had been overwhelmed by a violent attack of rheumatism that affected her arm and prevented her from working in her usual assiduous manner. She added that she had tried with all her might to overcome this malady, and had attempted twenty different times to use the distaff and the spindle, but all in vain. Despite her perseverance, she had only been able to spin a small amount of yarn, which she showed to the queen. Now, Queen La Barriuse found her work remarkably beautiful, and confirmed her opinion of Rosaline's dexterity. Since the queen was a good woman, she told Rosini not to force herself to work and recommended the ministrations of the chief doctor. Rosini, fearful that this doctor might discover that nothing was wrong with her, told the queen that she did not need any remedy for this malaise. Whenever she had been incapacitated by such an attack before, she had needed only to rest for it to pass. The queen was satisfied but with this explanation, but after Rosini withdrew, the queen's attendants, jealous of the great favors the queen had shown the newcomer at court, remarked very loudly that the cramps and this rheumatism assuredly resulted from the queen's orders. Most likely, this beauty, whom everybody believed so skillful and diligent, was nothing but a clumsy, dawdling worker. Poor Rosini, who had heard these remarks, was greatly affected by them. To complete her disgrace, the queen's daughters and other ladies-in-waiting having noticed how poorly she had dressed herself and positioned her headdress, burst out into peals of laughter and made a thousand jokes about the violet bodice and the short skirt that she had worn on her arrival. Indeed, they maintained that it had been a very great mistake to take those things away from her, since they suited her better than the garments of a young lady of the court. Rosalie could not withstand such provocations, so she left the palace and went towards the gardens. Once there, she kept walking until she found herself in a very dense woods. She felt exhausted and sat down at the edge of a rippling stream that wound its way through the trees. She began to mope and ponder her bad fortune and what role it played in bringing about the sad state she was in. For a moment, she almost decided to return to her mother. But when the thought about that woman's harsh treatment of her ever since the loss of her father, she reproached herself for having the slightest idea of returning. Young and curious about what the world was, she felt an aversion to the village and its ways, and her stay in court, however brief, had certainly not diminished this feeling. On the other hand, she saw clearly that the queen, indignant, would expel her from the palace in shame, and perhaps even punish her if she realized that Rosany had deceived her about her skill in spinning. Knowing that the truth was about to manifest itself, she was defeated and worn out. She could no longer feign cramps or rheumatism with success, nor did she want to allow those people who envied her to make her a laughing stock. Thus, cruelly reflecting, she abandoned herself completely to her despair. There was nothing left for her to do but to die. With this idea in mind and forgetting her weariness, she stood up to walk to a high open pavilion at the other end of the wood, where the ladies had shown her the day before during their promenade. She intended to climb to the top and throw herself to the ground. Nevertheless, her natural love for life, thoughts about her tender youth, and above all, her secret vanity regarding her own beauty, all made her weep in anticipation of her death, and she sought to walk very slowly towards the fatal spot, 
where she had condemned herself to die. As she was about to cross a path that led to the pavilion, a large, dark, and well-dressed man suddenly emerged. He was somber in appearance, but had a jovial, gracious air about him as he spoke. "'Where are you going, my pretty child?' he inquired. "'It seems to me that I see tears streaming from your eyes. Tell me what's bothering you. It would have to be something extraordinary for me not to be able to help you.' "'Alas!' responded Rosanie. There is nothing anyone can do against the troubles that have overwhelmed me. Therefore, it's useless for me to reveal anything to you. Perhaps, replied the stranger, but it is not so impossible for as you think in your despair. At the very least, you can relieve yourself by talking about your troubles. Tell me all about them. There is nobody better you can confide in. Since you insist, answered Rosini, I'll tell you my entire history. I have the misfortune of being born in obscure circumstances. My father was a peasant, a good man of integrity and intelligence, and he developed a fine reputation among the inhabitants of our village and the villages nearby, so that they asked him to arbitrate all their differences. Since he was very reserved and disliked idle talk, he was called Desinteux. Having been in the army, where his captain had esteemed him highly, he did not have those repulsive rustic manners and speech of people who never leave their village. My father had a tender love for me, and from my earliest childhood he took care to teach me all that he knew. If I have a great love for virtue and am somewhat intelligent, I owe it all to him, for my mother is a frankly coarse woman. Moreover, she never took any pains to teach me what she knew. In fact, she was always hard with me and disliked me. All her tenderness was reserved for my brother. Despite my village background and my limited education, I have feelings and inclinations of someone much above my station. Of course, the fact that I am of low birth causes me great despair. The only consolation I have resides in my fair features. They allow me to hope that I may have a happy future. When I was only 12 years old, I would often go to a spring or brook into which I could gaze, telling myself that I would never remain beneath a thatched roof. Giving such ideas, I scorned the compliments of the young boys of the village paid me. However, I barely turned 14 when my father re received some of the best possible proposals for my hand that a person of my rank could hope for. Then he told me about them. I dissolved in tears and told him forcefully that I would prefer to die than to enter into any marriage of that kind. Thanks to his love for me, he did not force me to accept any of the proposals. My mother kept complaining that he was spoiling me by blindly complying with my will. Yet, despite her words, he did not change his kind nature. On the contrary, he often reproached my mother for not loving me, and asserted that only her son was dear to her. Alas, it did not take long for her love to prove the truth of my father's words. He went on a journey and did not inform us why or where he was going. Though he assured us that he would return soon, he must have died during this unfortunate journey, for a great deal of time has passed and he has not come back. My mother began regarding herself as my absolute mistress, and she treated me as harshly as was possible. Finally, two days ago, after scolding me cruelty, cruelly for spinning insufficiently, she started dragging me towards our cottage, and at just that time the king's son happened to pass by and asked why she was abusing me. She answered him mockingly, and I told him that it was because I spin too much. The prince thought she was serious, and since our queen is very favorably disposed towards all kind of work, and especially takes great delight in spinning, the prince immediately asked me 
asked my mother whether she would give me to the queen. My mother was overjoyed to get rid of me and placed me in the hands of the prince's men right on the spot. They presented me to the queen as the best and most diligent spinner in the entire kingdom, though I am truly the last person in the world to possess such qualities as those. Nevertheless, the queen believed that I had them, and she gave me such a terrible amount of work to do that just the sight of it all sends shivers up my spine. I think that she has gathered together all the best flax in the world in order to overwhelm me. Given, however, how much I hate spinning and how slowly I accomplish it, I don't know whether to begin, where to begin, or how to spin, or how slowly I will accomplish it. I don't know where to begin or how I can finish such boring and old nerverating work. On the other hand, I have no other choice if I want to stay at court. Alas, how happy I was at first when I found myself at the palace and heard my beauty praised. I recalled the dreams of vanity from my youth and flattered myself that some nobleman of the court, or at least one of the royal officers, would be sufficiently taken with me to want to marry me and share his fortune with me. I even for a few moments believed, oh what a presumption, that the prince would regard me with passion. And now what is left of all that? How depressing to feel that I lack the skill even to dress myself properly, thus distorting the gifts nature has bestowed upon me. Nor do I have the skill to spin quickly. Because of all this, I'll be expelled in shame and the queen, by the queen and become the laughing stock of all the envious young women who previously trembled because of my beauty and the favors I received. So, Monsieur, Rosani concluded, although you don't know me, you can see that there is no remedy for my troubles, and, to hope, and I hope to end my torments through some fatal means which I shan't reveal.